Thank you so much, Peter, and thank you uh, to each one of you for allowing me to come here and to speak in this this symposium. I I, I have to confess that I I feel I feel uh, uh, way behind many of you on the theological aspects and and uh, the philosophical ramifications. I I never did very well in philosophy in school, and so so uh, it's it's always is it's always hard for me to uh, uh, speak in those sort of dimensions. So I'm gonna do the best, the very best I can. Uh, scientists remain clueless on the origin of life. Um, and I, I also wanna apologize up front. I have some trouble with my vocal cords. So if, if it seems like I'm, I'm battling something in my throat, I am. Uh, uh, it's just a vocal cord trouble that I've had for years uh, and it flares up occasionally. So this is my family, so you can just See that, that uh, uh, Peter said I'm very busy. I, I'm probably no more busy than any of you. Uh, I've got four wonderful children and, uh, uh, and uh, two grandchildren and, and a son-in-law. And you can, you can probably tell genetically which one is my son-in-law. Um, and so, so uh, uh, this is my family. And I work in a number of areas that don't have anything to do with origin of life, but have to do with, with a whole whole host of materials type topics, as well as uh, uh, biological topics, for example, nanomachines drilling into cells, things like that, uh, uh, to kill, we're killing super bacteria and cancer. And so we're working on a number of these sorts of areas, which take us into the medicinal world. Um, uh, this is, this is just, this is an overview of the companies that I've started in the last six years. And several of them actually are are uh, uh, revolve around medicine, uh, the nanorobotics, the molecular mach nanomachines in medicine, and then uh, Zariant pancreatic cancer treatment that that is in uh, in uh, entering phase two, uh, uh, just this year entering into phase two. Uh, this is working out very well, and then we'll start another company on traumatic brain injury, stroke, and dementia this year. So so uh, uh, we do work in some of the biological areas, even though. My training is as a synthetic chemist, but directed toward natural products is, is how I was trained. Um, so what is abiogenesis? Abiogenesis is the origin of life from non-living matter. For synthesis to be categorized as prebiotically relevant, we're going to have to use chemicals and conditions that are presumed to be available upon early earth. Um, uh, abiogenesis takes place before biology and before biological evolution. Uh, so it's something we have to think about before we're going to be talking about biology. Uh, what are the characteristics of life? We have to keep this in mind because right now, right now things, things are, uh, the discussion is actually evolving. But if you look historically, what has been the characteristics of life? It was responsiveness to the environment, growth and change, ability to reproduce, having a metabolism and breathe, maintain homeostasis, being made of cells, very important, being made of cells and passing traits onto offspring. And homeostasis is the steady internal physical and chemical condition. Uh, some people have added that it's going to have to be, uh, 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 it, it's going to have to be uh, able to evolve. So that, that's been added later. But that's not the things that really concern me on the things that are being added. What people are trying to do now is, is even make this devoid of cells, just saying certain simple reactions are showing characteristics of life. And therefore, we are creating life by this. And, and uh, uh, but that, they're, they're, they're changing life into an image that they think that they can address because this definition of life is, is uh, something that, that uh, uh, has always been uh, for many, many decades has been this. And, and so, so um, we've gotta be able to deal with a cell. It's gotta be able to reproduce. It's gotta be able to have a metabolism, gotta be able to have growth and change, pass on traits to its offspring. All right, molecules don't care about life. Organisms care about life, but molecules don't. Chemistry is, is utterly indifferent to life. Without a biological entity acting upon them, molecules have never been shown to evolve toward life, never. And I have asked colleagues and, and uh, uh, we go through a lot to try to get molecules to, to order in certain, uh, uh, in certain ways. 
but they don't move toward life. They, they have no impetus to move toward life. They don't have brains. They don't want to go in those sorts of directions. Uh, so so uh, um, it's not something molecules want to go toward. So even this terminology, chemical evolution, is, is a term that, that's hard for me as a chemist to embrace because molecules don't evolve in this way. When they talk about chemical evolution going toward life, it's, it's hard to fathom this. Uh, so if you take a look at carbohydrates, which are also called sugars, which are also called saccharides, and then you have the polymers they're from. So those would be the polysaccharides or polycarbohydrates. Those are the most difficult classes of compounds to think about. I have spent, uh, uh, as many as of you may have seen, I have a 14 part series now on YouTube, which was a response to, to uh, uh, a person who goes by the name Professor Dave, who has now 1.35 million subscribers. Actually, he's picked up 400,000 subscribers since he, he made his first video about me. Uh, and he, he talks about the abiogenesis and spends a lot of time psychoanalyzing me, God bless him. And uh, 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 he told me lots of things about myself that I really didn't even know myself. And so, so um, uh, that has, has gotten him a lot, of, a lot more subscribers. And I did battle with 46 minutes of his presentation not even addressing the theological things that he was attacking, just going after the scientific things, took me 14 videos to address uh, and about 10 to 12 hours, 10 or 11, 12 hours, something like that for 46 minutes of his. Now he's come up with another two-part series that eventually I might have to address. But uh, uh, the carbohydrates are the most difficult class. So I'm not gonna talk about all the classes of compounds here because I address them all in that YouTube series. And, uh, and I talk about the difficulties of making those, but carbohydrates are by far the most difficult ones. So if you just look at the monosaccharides, just look at the monosaccharides, you have all of these different ones, you have all of these different sugars you have to deal with. And saccharides, they're the hardest of everything. And they can be beta linked, one four linked, they can be two one linked, they can be alpha and beta. So this is this is this below and above this, it, at the glycosidic center, and they can be linked on at different places. So if you look at the syntheses that have been made, if you're going to talk about DNA and RNA, you've got to be able to make ribose. And uh, uh, just making ribose by, by a simple, say, foremost reaction is really difficult. Eschenmoser, who's an excellent chemist, has tried to do this, as have many others, and you get a lot of different compounds uh, in here. You get all of these, these uh, an, you get the enantiomers and you get the diastereomers of ribose. And so you, you have to deal with all of these mixtures and that makes the chemistry really complex. It's hard to do chemistry when you have these sorts of mixtures. I was just listening to the rebuttal to my series from this individual. I'm not done listening to it, but but uh, he concedes, yeah, there, there, there was no carbohydrate synthesis until we had enzymes. So the, he says the enzymes had to come first because uh, hooking up carbohydrates is just a big, big problem. So making them is hard. Uh, controlling their stereochemistry is really hard because if you have the wrong stereochemistry, it just gums up the works. It's, it's just a hard chemical problem. So if making saccharides or sugars was not hard enough, the polysaccharide problem, hooking the sugars together is just as hard. And so if, for example, you just look at D-glucose, so you just look at D-glucose, it can reside in the, in the open form. So you can have this, this open form and then it can reside in the six-membered closed ring form with the alpha or the beta configuration here. Let me just get my pointer. So it can have the alpha or the beta configuration or it can reside in the five-membered closed ring form. So you have five different forms that it can reside in. And you have to think about polymerizing with all of these species being there. Uh, each has five stereogenic centers. So, so uh, uh, each has 32 possible stereoisomers. So this is, this is a big, big problem. So even if you had D-glucose with this two to the fourth possible, possible isomers, 
then you have to say, well, you can have the, the closed form six membered, the closed form five member. And uh, uh, so it's a big problem. And see, and you can see these sorts of things where you can have six membered closed ring forms, five membered closed ring forms. You can have connections through this, this four linkage of this one and through the number one linkage uh, of this one. And then you can have it hooked. So it, this, this is, this is uh, uh, this, this, this sort of, well, this is the one, two linkage. Here's a one, three linkage and all of these different isomers. It's a big problem. And then if you just take six different, say, say you had six different uh, saccharides, hexasaccharides, like D-glucose, how many ways could these six different compounds polymerize? And it turns out you can get 10 to the 12 structural isomers on their polymerization. So I'm not talking about having, having uh, all the other isomers of D-glucose, all the other stereo. I'm just saying D-glucose itself. It's if you were to think about this in the terms of, of say, DNA, say you had a certain uh, A unit, and how many ways in DNA could that polymerize? And it's just one, A, 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 A. That's it. How many ways of D-glucose could you get this to polymerize? And it turns out just six of the same units is over a trillion different ways this can polymerize because you can have this OH hooked to this center or this OH hooked to this one or this OH hooked to that one or to that one or to that one. And then you can have the anomer of this hooking to each one of those. And then you have this, the next branch, which so it's a hard, hard synthetic problem. So I think people are even conceding now, yeah, you didn't get carbohydrates to polymerize. You're going to have to have enzymes first. Uh, before you can get this to polymerize. That's the latest thing that I've seen, that there's this concession now, because this is just a really hard problem. This is the hardest of them. There are problems in polymerizing, uh, uh, in, in, in polymerizing the, these bases for just making uh, 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 RNA, where you can have the 3,5 or the 2,5. And these things are big problems. You have the stability problem that occurs. So all of these come in. Uh, the interactomes, these are the non-covalent interactions, the non-covalent interactions that are going to take place uh, uh, through just the protein-protein interactions in a single yeast cell. So if you had a yeast cell, what's the non-covalent interactions? You say, well, what's important about that? We're just worried about the covalent. No, it turns out that the non-covalent interactions in a cell are extremely important. And I'm not just talking about the base pairing in a duplex of DNA or a DNA RNA duplex. I'm not just talking about the, the RNA enzyme pairing, RNA uh, 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 peptide pairing. I'm talking about all the molecular interactions. So if we just look at the non-covalent interactive connectivity within a, within a functioning cell, so we're just taking the interaxome. So we're going to consider the, just the protein-protein combinations in just a single yeast cell. This is not my estimate. Here's, the, here's the Tampa and Rose. And they are not at a Christian university. They're at uh, uh, University of Brussels in Belgium and uh, at Johns Hopkins. And they calculate 10 to the 79 billion combinations. Now, Mind you, the number of elemental particles in the universe is 10 to the 90. This is 10 to the 79 billion. If you look at the non-covalent interactions, so, so uh, uh, this is like the, 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 this, this protein folding problem 2.0. And, and uh, uh, so, so that's sort of what it's called. Uh, this is just the non-covalent interactions. You say, well, how important is this? It turns out that the non-covalent interactions are highly important because what happens is there's an ordered alignment. And this is why you can't dehydrate a cell. I mean, and pulling out even the structural waters. You can, you can, you can lightly dehydrate a cell and get it to rework, but you can't take out even the structural waters, that level of dehydration and ever rehydrate the cell to work. It's because of this. It's because of the ordering that is taking place, the non-covalent interactions between the molecules. They don't just go back into the order. And you say, well, why is non-covalent interaction important? 
It's because what happens is, and we had shown this a number of years ago when we were building something called a synthetic brain, a molecular brain. And, and uh, uh, you take molecules and you, you align them in a certain way. And now you pass information through these ordered systems. How, do that, how does that information transfer? The information transfers through what a physicist would call electrostatic potentials. And the information passes through these, these entities. And it's they're traveling at near the speed of light. So information transfer is going through these ordered alignments. Now, a lot of my career, for more than 10 years of my career, I was building polymeric systems that had conjugated pi systems. So you had repeated sp2 centers or sp centers. We had repeated uh, pi orbitals so that you can put information down these conjugated systems. But nature seems not to do that. Nature seems to favor very often not using conjugated systems, just using ordered systems. And I talk about this in, in the recent YouTube series. I have a section on chiral induced spin selectivity. So if you don't know what that is, you really ought to watch that one video. It's only like 30 minutes. Get an introduction to chiral induced spin selectivity. And this is work that's done by Ron Nauman, uh, uh, Tony Futterman's colleague there at the Weissman Institute. And, and uh, uh, it's utterly amazing what happens through non-conjugated systems, how you take chiral systems and information transfer, but only the spin of one electron. So electrons can have spin up or spin down, but it uses only the spin. So it matches the spin to the chirality of the system. And through that, you limit the number, you greatly reduce the number of inelastic scatterings. And what does that do? It greatly reduces the heat the energy that's needed for this system. And that's how a cell can operate. People always wonder, why doesn't a cell just burn up with all the chemistry that's taking place? Now we know, because it's using chiral induced spin cell activity. And all of this ordering is absolutely essential because information is passed through this and electrons at a, of a particular spin are being passed through this. And so there's the, this big ordering. So there's these staggering numbers, just absolutely staggering and uh, um, that, that are just, just crazy big. All right, then there's the origin of information. Critical for life is the origin of information, DNA or RNA. The information is actually primary and the matter is secondary. And the reason I say that is you can have the same information stored on many different mediums. I can store information on my computer in flash memory or I can store it in magnetic memory I can, I can put it through a wave going to the Wi-Fi box on the wall, and now the information is in another form, but it's the same information, but it's in a different medium. And then it goes through actually a physical wire to the cloud, which is, which is a server farm, which is now filled up with a bunch of flash memories again, which is a deep trench capacitor where you, where you store a charge. And now it goes right back into a flash memory. So the same information that I had in my head, in my brain, that I wrote it down on a piece of paper, now it's transferred to the paper, and now I transcribe that into DRAM in my computer, and that goes to SRAM, goes to, to flash memory, it went to flash memory, and then it went to, to in, into the, the uh, I uploaded it through, through a wave, through this RF, to the box on the wall, then it goes through a wire, ends up in a server form. Same information, all these different mediums, which has you know, profound implications scripturally as well. In the beginning was the word and the word, and, and, and it says that the word was God, the, the, this information was in the beginning. The word was with God, the word was God. And then we get down to verse 14 of John chapter one, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. Now this information took on matter in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so information is actually primary. It's primary in the scriptures. In the beginning was the word. It wasn't matter. It was the word. The information is primary. The matter on which it is placed is secondary. The information goes from DNA to RNA to enzymes, and then that, those enzymes put that information into other structures. And the thing I forgot to mention is the amount of information you can put into a, into a polysaccharide is much, much larger 
than the information that you can put into DNA and RNA because the polysaccharides have all these connectivity differences. And what happens with polysaccharides on the surface of a cell, they are modified by other cells, by other exogenous things. So there's other DNA working on the arrangements of those. So you, you just fill those things up with information. Anyway, so this is, this is what we've got to deal with. We've got to deal with information as well. All right, so if you think about synthetic cells, you say, well, haven't people made synthetic cells? Well, let, let's look at that. So in 2010, Craig Venter's team copied an existing bacterial genome and transplanted it into another cell. All right, so you have a working cell. You take another genome and you put it into that cell. He didn't make the cell, but it got this term synthetic cell. So when I say that nobody's ever made a cell ab initio, people will say, oh, there's synthetic cells. Well, this is what was done. Well, then in 2016, they made what they called a synthetic cell derived from a bacterial pathogen. So the bacterium, it had, a, it had 901 genes and it had 428 of its genes were deleted, rendered inactive. So that 473 genes remained. While the cell with 473 genes appeared to, to function they could not reproduce properly, which is an essential function for the definition of life. Remember what we said, that life, you, it's gonna be able to have to reproduce itself. It couldn't, couldn't reproduce very well. well. No surprise, you took a bacterium with 901 genes and you, you knocked out 428 of its genes. So you, so you knock out about half of its genes, it's not gonna work very well. But there were 473 remaining. This is what they call the synthetic cell. There was already a cell. It was already there. They already had the interactomes. They already had all the carbohydrates in the right form. They already had everything. They knocked out 473, 428, 473 remain. Didn't function very well. Then in 2021, the same team from the Venter Institute along with NIST reintroduced seven of the formerly deleted genes back into the cell. Remember they, they, they knocked out all of these. Well, they put seven of them back into the cell now totaling 480 genes and the organism was capable of reproduction. So again, this is what the world is calling synthetic cell. And so this is why we have to be careful because they will, they will morph definitions to make it appear as if they did something when they, they really didn't accomplish the task that they, they you, you know, that, they, that, that is challenging them. All right, so I put forth this challenge at the end of my video series. Uh, uh, okay. If you say that the homochirality problem is solved, which is what this YouTuber said, it's, he says it's solved. Okay, and, and now he says, it doesn't matter what your yield is in a chemical reaction, even if it's only 10%, it doesn't matter because autocatalysis will take over and it'll just make all that it needs. So interestingly, sit with a synthetic chemist and tell them that the yield of your reaction does not matter. Just leave it there. Autocatalysis will take the one that you want and make a whole lot of it. And, and, uh, uh, and all you need is 1% EE and, and uh, uh, you'll, you'll, get, you'll get this autocatalytic chiral induction and you'll get it up to 100% EE. That's what the claim is. So anyway, so I say, okay, I'll give you all of that. You know, a Nobel Prize would be awarded to anyone who could make a working cell. Not a complex cell, even just a simple cell, a minimal cell that shows the functions of life. And so the other argument that keeps morphing from them is that, that uh, um, well, cells were much simpler that back then. Well, how's it much simpler than they are now? Well, how's it much simpler? Okay, let's see how simple they need to be. So here is the calculation of a minimal cell. What is required for a minimal cell? It has to have some form of metabolism to provide molecular building blocks and energy necessary for synthesizing cellular components, genetic replication from a template or an equivalent information processing and transfer machinery, and a boundary, a membrane that separates the cell from its environment. So here's what bioengineers can, can calculate. And so this is what they're, they're, they're able to calculate. So the smallest natural genome capable of autonomous growth or laboratory cultivation in pure culture, and also in a defined medium is one of M genitalium, with 580 kilobases. That's 580,000 bases or 580,000 nucleotides are needed. All right. 
The first theoretical minimal gene set was proposed by Mushkin and Kunin and consisted of 256 genes. Later, there was another calculation and it was said you could get away with 206. Okay, so you'd have to get 206. So remember, uh, um, uh, you'd have to have 206 genes for a the theoretical uh, 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 minimum gene set. So what's a gene? It's a distinct sequence of nucleotides forming a part of a chromosome the order of which determines the order of monomers in a polypeptide or a nucle nucleic acid, which a cell or virus may synthesize. So you're gonna to have to have 206 genes. So this game that it was much, much simpler. Well, now we know this is, this is calculated. This is as simple as it can possibly get. You're still gonna need 206 genes, all right. So within that, you're gonna to have to have all of these things, you're gonna to have to have this is what the minimal gene set is going to have to have. DNA replication, repair, restriction, modification, basic transcription machinery, amino acyl tRNA synthesis, tRNA mat uh, maturation and modification, ribosomal proteins, ribosomal function, maturation and modification, translation factors, RNA degradation, protein processing, folding, secretion, cellular division, transport, and energetic and intermediary metabolism, which does all of these functions listed here. These authors did not include rRNA or tRNA genes, and they recognized that the basic substrate transport machinery could not be clearly defined, even though this minimal cell will rely greatly on the import of several, several several substrates, including all 20 amino acids, because there was no biosynthetic pathway. So it would have to have from exogenous sources, all of these 20 amino acids, but it's going to have to have all of this. So if you're going to make a cell, you want to make a proto cell, it's going to have to have all of this to really say that this is, this is a simple cell. You can't just have a homogeneous membrane that can't keep proton gradients and, and, and just stick a bunch of DNA in there and think you have a cell. It's going to have to be able to do all of this. This is what it's got to be able to do. All right. So now make the simplest cell for me. You're going to have to start here. You're going to have to make the four classes of molecules. Each one of these has stereogenic centers. Monomeric sugars, if you're talking about glucose, you're going to have four stereo centers. So you've got a bunch of sugars you're going to have to make. You're going to have a bunch of amino acids you're going to have to make. All, uh, uh, most of them have a stereogenic center. 19 of them have a stereogenic center here. So you're gonna to have to deal with, with, with the homochiral problem here. Then you're gonna to have to make the nucleotides, which first you're gonna to have to solve sugars, and then you're gonna to have to make these structures. But again, here's, here's four stereo centers that you're gonna to have to control. Then you're gonna to have to make the lipids. Well, to make lipids, you're gonna to have to desymmetrize uh, uh, glycerol. And so these are enantiotopic hydroxymethyl groups. You've got to somehow desymmetrize these to get this chiral material because lipids are also chiral. So you're going to have to, so you first have to make these, and then you're going to have to figure out how to make these larger structures from them, the polymers they're from. Not easy to do. This is where you got to start. If you're really going to make that cell, you can't just go to biology and get these. You're going to have to start here. But realizing this is too hard. I'll give you all of these. I'll give you all of these. All of these are yours. All right. I'll give you all the, 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 the monomeric sugars you want, the amino acids. You've got all 20 of them. You get, I'll give you all the nucleotides for both DNA and the RNA, the, the deoxy for DNA and, the, and, and the, the, with the hydroxyl for RNA. And I'll give you the, I'll give you glycerol and you can, I'll, I'll give you a technique to desymmetrize those. We'll give you some organometallic technique to do that. All right. Go ahead, polymerize those. Show me how you're going to do that. You can't use enzymes here because no enzymes yet. Or if you want to make amino acids, go ahead, make some enzymes and try to get these things polymerized. But I realize that problem is too hard. So I'll give you all of these. I'll provide this too. Not only will I provide these, this to you, I'll provide these in any sequence you want. So I'm giving you the informational code. Remember, th these I'm giving you everything. I'm giving you everything now. I'm giving you the polymers in every form you want with all the stereo centers you want, with all the, the, the sequence information. So you've got, you've got them in, in, in polymeric form now with the information you want. Now just build a cell, go ahead. Because a Nobel prize awaits you if you could do that. So if it's that simple, just do it. You've got, every, you've got all the components, just make the cell. If you think it's so easy, just go ahead and make the cell. So a Nobel prize awaits you, a mindless earth made all the small molecules in homochiral form, which I'm giving you all the polymers of those molecules, which I'm giving you, the proton gradient inducing bilayers, which I'll give you, the interactomes, 
you got to somehow get these to interact right through the non-covalent interactions. Think about how you do that. We have no idea. And everything else, the dream team can use their entire labs and separated gases in any chemicals they want in pure form. I won't restrict them to working under a rock or in some tidal pool. You can do this in your lab. But even if given all, these, all the pieces and the informational code, they cannot build a cell. And nobody, nobody who knows what they're doing about anything would claim that they could. This is what we're up against. Now, I'm not saying that it could never be done. As a scientist, I cannot know that. So I would not claim it. But I can say that we're nowhere close to solving this problem. And how do I know we're nowhere close? Because of this. Because how do I know we're nowhere close? Because we can track our progress relative to the target of making a living cell. And the target, the goalpost keeps moving. It keeps moving. Every year we learn more about the cell. We learn about, about uh, uh, this, this, this paradox, this 2.0 of all of this interact on things. And so the, the complexity of the cell has moved further away from us. So we are moving, we are further from solving this than we were formerly. And this is why when Miller Urey got these amino acids, we thought that we were gonna crack this problem, but it's only gotten harder because we've learned much more about the cell. So when you see articles like this, researchers solve a puzzle of origin of life on earth, that's an amazing claim. And then you look at the papers and really all they did is they got some building blocks, like they bought some amino acids and, the, and they had those interact with the membrane of, of they made a, they took a membrane and had those interact. So they have, they fill this with RNA and proteins that they, they synthesize through biological expression. And they come out with a claim like that, where researchers, researchers solve the problem of origin of life on earth. And because my name is out there among the masses, I get emails all the time from people saying, you got to watch this video. They solved this problem. They really solved this problem. They, they, they created a cell. They, they did this and then you look at it and they haven't solved anything. So the claims just, just really get boost, boost up. So I'm not talking about God of the, of the gaps. As I said, as a scientist, I would never say that we will never understand. One day in the distant future, we might understand life's origin and evolution of a complex system. We might understand all of this, but that's not gonna lessen God. We'll see him as all the more magnanimous just because we've under, we understand where information is stored in the DNA in a cell you know, it makes me as a chemist look at this and say, Lord, you are amazing. This is wonderful, the way you've stored this information in there. If you had asked somebody 300 years ago, how come when, when the parents are tall, their, their offspring are tall? I don't know. I mean, God. Well, now we know that this is, this is embedded in this information of the DNA, which prescribes the proteins that builds that in individual. It doesn't lessen God for us. It makes them all the more magnanimous. I'm just saying we're, we're clueless on how this happens. And when we find out how it happened, if, if there's a nice materialistic explanation for, for this, of, of the chemistry that can be used to make this happen, it doesn't lessen God. It's going to make them all the more magnanimous. To the student that's presented with misinformation, Deuteronomy 13, verse 3 and 4 says, you must not listen to the words of that prophet or dreamer. The Lord your God is testing you to find out whether you love him with all your heart and with all your soul. It is the Lord your God you must follow and him you must revere. Keep his commands and obey him, serve him and hold fast to him. And so what I tell Christian students, don't let these things upset you. God may be allowing this in to test you, to see what it's really like, just to test your faith, to see what it's like when you hear these things. Are you going to abandon him because of this? He may just be testing your faith. These are, you may hear false prophet. These are the false prophets of our days to make pro proclamations like the origin of life has been solved. Scientists solve puzzle of the origin of life. And then you look into it, nothing's been solved. Let me leave you with this. Is there a prescription for thriving? And in Psalm 1, it says this. How blessed is the man who doesn't walk in the counsel of the wicked, nor stand in the path of sinners, nor sit in the seat of scoffers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. And he will be like a tree firmly planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither, and in whatever he does he prospers. This is a blessing that comes by delighting in the law of the Lord and meditating on his word day and night. 
If you want to see the promised blessing of God in your life, it is daily meditation. The Bible puts it in two different ways, meditation day and night and meditation all the day. If you make the Word of God your daily meditation, and I'm talking not about a quick read, I'm talking about when you get alone with the Word of God and say, Lord, speak to me through this passage. Speak to me as I read this morning. Speak to me. And you read slowly, pensively, deliberately, thoughtfully. You are going to fall into this great blessing. This great blessing, because it's promised over and over again. It's promised here in Psalm 1, Psalm 112, verse 1 and 2. It's Psalm, uh, 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 Psalm 119, verse 97 through 100. Joshua 1 verses 8 and 9. Again and again, this promise comes. There is no promise for three days a week in the Word of God. Maybe there's a blessing, maybe there's not. I don't know. The promise is for every day. You want to enter into the blessing? Do this. Creativity. In my business, in my business, it's not how smart we are that makes us a sell. It's how creative we are, where people read our papers and go, whoa, I wish I'd have thought of that. The Bible tells us where to get creativity. Exodus 31, verse 2 and 3, it says, See, I have called by name Bezalel, the son of Uri, the son of Hur of the tribe of Judah. I have filled him with the spirit of wisdom and understand, f- f- spirit of God in wisdom and understanding and in knowledge and in all craftsmanship. God took a craftsman named Bezalel, whom Moses commissioned to build a, the tabernacle. He's the first person in the Bible that says he was filled with the spirit of God in the book of Exodus. He was a craftsman. He was not a preacher. He was a craftsman. God gave him wisdom, understanding, and then thirdly, knowledge. Firstly, wisdom. Secondly, understanding. Thirdly, knowledge. Because if we have knowledge without wisdom and understanding, we do dastardly things. And he gave him knowledge. And then you read in Exodus 31 and in Exodus 36 about Bezalel. He could work in gold, silver, and bronze. He could work with stone. It's cutting, stone setting. He could work with wood. He could work with fabric. He could work with perfuming, and he had the ability to teach it. Creativity comes from God. I pray, Lord, make me like Bezalel. Lord, make my students like Bezalel. Give us creativity. Creativity comes from God. This is what gets us to God. If you do not know God, if you have not received Jesus in his resurrection, this is the bottom line. That if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. This physical resurrection, this is the physical resurrection of Jesus Christ. If this is something that you cannot embrace, that you cannot take hold of, but you want to know more because this is what gets you to God, I would be glad. It will be my honor to have an individual Zoom call with you, and I will tell you why I believe this and how I came to this understanding. I come from a Jewish home, but I came to this understanding that Jesus Christ has risen physically from the dead. I will meet with you, and we will discuss it. You want to attain peace in your life? This is The Bible tells us what to do. Everybody wants peace. It says, the things that you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, that's Paul speaking, practice these things, and the God of peace will be with you. You make the Word of God your daily meditation, doesn't mean that your life is going to be all smooth every day, but you will have peace. That I know because it's promised. You will have peace. You make the Word of God your daily meditation, you will have peace. If your life is is a mess, if your marriage is a mess, if your workplace is a mess, you get into daily meditation on the Word of God and you will have peace. I will meet with you. You could just send me tour at drjamestour.org. That'll come to me. I will set up an individual Zoom call with you. This is only for people who do not believe in the physical resurrection of Jesus Christ. And they're seeking an opportunity to hear about why I believe this. So there's, that's the invitation. And I'll set up a one-hour Zoom call with you. And you will get saved that very day. You'll not leave that Zoom call conversation without getting saved. All right. With that, I'll end and I'll open it up for questions.